Broadcast has been set. Thank you. Hello, everyone. The time is now 5.02. I call to order the May 16, 2023 Policy and Governance Committee meeting. My name is Albert Strohn Rees, Chair of the Policy and Governance Committee and student member of the board. Uh, it brings me great pleasure to welcome everyone tonight. And we will start with introductions of our committee members, board members, and administration staff. Board Hi. member Walter Fields. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Walt. Board member Walter Fields, Vice Chair of Policy and Governance Committee. Good evening. Uh, Judy Mickens Murray, board member and member of Policy and Governance Committee, also board chair. Good evening. Hi. Hi, good evening, everyone. Pamela Boozer Struther, District 3 Board of Education member and member of this committee. Good evening, Sharon Dent, Board of Education Office Director. Good evening, Doug Strader, Chief of Accountability. Good evening, Robin Welsh, Director of Government Relations, Compliance and Procedures. Good evening, Rihanna McCarter, Manager of Pupil Accounting and School Boundaries. Good evening, everyone. Dennis Whitley III with the Law Office of Shipley and Horn Board Council. Good evening, Cindy Adai, Board Administrative Secretary. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. If I may, we also uh, have John Wooden uh, with us from Pupil County School Boundaries as well. Yeah. Right. I'm sorry. I missed the first part. I was adjusting my volume. No worries. Yep. We're just doing introductions. Oh, okay. So I'm John Wooden. I'm a people, specialist for people accounting, um, <laughs> Prince George's County Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we have. A quorum has been met. Therefore, may I have a motion to adopt the May 16, 2023 meeting agenda. So moved. Second. Okay. It's been properly moved and second to adopt tonight's agenda. Are there any objections? Hearing none, motion passes and the agenda is adopted. Um, approval of committee meeting, meeting minutes. We have a motion to approve the April 18, 2023 meeting minutes. Move to adopt the um, April 18th. 18th meeting minutes. Second. It's been properly moved and second to approve the April 18th meeting minutes. Any objections? Hearing no objections, motion passes and the minutes are approved. Moving on to public comment. There's one registered public comment speaker this evening. Um, Ms. Adlin, is Ms. Wingfield here? As of right now, she's not. Okay, so we will move along and just let me know if she call, she joins the call. So move to our legislative update. Uh, Ms. Welsh, do you have a May Legislative Committee meeting update? So um, there hasn't been a May Legislative Committee meeting, so I have nothing to report from May, but I do know that today was the last day for the governor to sign uh, bills um, into effect. And so... Um, I think everything's been signed or, or nothing's been vetoed, at least I should say. Um, and many of the bills that we have talked about in the past, they have uh, have passed. So we will be working hard uh, on the administration and to put together a document that shows what are the what are the uh, things that we need to do to implement to make sure we're um, in compliance with the law. OK, thank you, Ms. Welsh. Colleagues, any questions? Uh, I don't have a question, um, Chair Alvarez, Theron Ruiz, but I attended a training session that John Willems had yesterday, and it was a a um, he it was a synopsis of all bills that passed, and I will forward that uh, to you. Our bills were not mentioned uh, by House bill name or anything, and we did not go into any in depth uh, discussion about those bills. But he focused pretty much on the bills that would um, 
in, include extra work for the, the administration. So I, I'll forward that to you guys so that you can uh, read it. But it's a, it's a different group from the one that he had given us through the, the legislative committee. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. We move to our blueprint implementation update. Ms. Boozer Strether. Yeah, thank you so much, Chair. Um, I did receive from Dr. Libby, uh, Strategic Initiatives Officer and Blueprint Coordinator, uh, a written report um, the other day uh, before the agenda was posted. And I would like to request that this May 15th document uh, be added to this, um, added to the agenda or added as a follow-up to ensure that it's um, associated with the meeting. The, um, uh, as you know, Dr. Libby uh, oversaw the plan uh, drafting with a team that I think uh, approached about 100 stakeholders in the system, including board members and the approval process through MSDE and the AIB continues. Um, there was a minor revisions where questions were sent back uh, and those have already gone uh, back and forth between PGCPS and MSDE and now we're included in a revision group um, that are moving from MSD plan re review review to uh, recommend MSD submits recommendations to the AIB, the Accountability Board, the blueprint. So um, those processes are outlined in the um, document submitted by Dr. Libby. And uh, one request that I had of her is to help determine the um, how this fits for which board meeting it would make sense for the work session on this final plan that gets through MSD and um, AIB. And those revised plans are being posted to, to our website where this is housed. So I will, I will note that as well. And um, I'll stop there if there's any questions or if um, Vice Chair Fields uh, would like to add anything from the you know, his uh, oversight work on this as well. I, I, I just want to commend again our staff for their work um, in submitting the plan. Uh, Prince George's County uh, Public Schools um, is a leader in uh, embracing the blueprint for Maryland's future. Uh, we um, have a little time because uh, all plans won't be approved until July, but I think we should be um, very satisfied and very encouraged by the work of our staff on this. And I look forward to when our plan is formally finally approved, making sure that we follow its implementation um, to the letter. Yeah, thank you, Vice Chair Fields. And I definitely want to second the, you know, Dr. Libby's work as a coordinator is, uh, she is also, you know, a, you know, a colleague to the Blueprint coordinators from around the state. And um, you know, our collaborative relationship, I think, is, you know, very, very good between board and uh, blueprint coordinator. And um, I'm really pleased with that, that that will serve us well and our students well. So um, I guess, right, unless there's any questions, I will conclude there. Thank you, colleagues. Any questions? Okay. Okay. Seeing none, okay. we'll move on. Thank you, Ms. Ruth Strother. All right, moving along. So now we have three policies for discussion. Colleagues, we will adhere to the five minute and three minute rules of discussion. Um, our first policy will be the policy geographic boundaries of attendance areas and the consolidation of schools. So you have the floor to Ms. Welsh for an update and review. So good evening. Um, so the um, pop, the um, what we actually what we did was we consolidated several of our policies into one policy, and now because um, House Bill four thirty seven has been it has been passed and signed, um, the part where it says that the Board of Education will now be responsible have the authority to close uh, public schools, we are able then to incorporate that policy into these policies. So you, what you see is 
um, that if, can you just scroll down, just uh, scroll up one second, Cindy, so I can uh, share the titles, Geographic Bound Boundaries of Attendance Areas and the Consolidation of Schools, because that now all of it falls under the uh, consolidation, uh, falls under the authority of the Board of Education. And I think uh, we went through this last um, week or last month, and we had a conversation. The question came up about um, how how are the decisions made in terms of looking at uh, projections and looking at uh, how we come to these uh, numbers and like, do we consult also with the county? Or are we looking at other sources? Like, what is the process? Um, in terms of uh, making the determination to move forward. So we actually have with us tonight the experts that know um, this whole, it will do this process and can provide answers to your questions um, regarding um, the, every, anything that you need to know related to the boundary process. So we have, of course, Dr. Strader with us and Re, Rihanna uh, McCarter and then John Woolen. So if you would um, like to start with your questions, any questions you might have from last time, we can do that. We also, I wanna point out that uh, board member Briggs did um, provide an email that had some had questions and then and comments and then had some suggestions and so that is the board should also then uh, the committee should have the opportunity to discuss that and certainly this um, our administration that's here tonight can certainly answer some of those questions too so um I, I don't know who would like to start first with thank their you. questions yeah thank you Ms. Welsh colleagues the floor is now open for questions or comments are there any? Okay, we'll start with Vice Chair Fields, followed by Board Member Briggs. So um, the issue of process, I think, is something that um, I'm really concerned about because anytime you consolidate or close a school, it's a it's a very emotional event. Um, how much do we factor in the concerns of parents, students, um, even former students, when we start talking about consolidating a school? Um, as we go forward, and we know there are always going to be population changes um, in the county, um, and when you look at our equity policy, we want to make sure that our schools are diverse and inclusive. So I would just like to get a sense of um, the engagement process uh, when we consider making these decisions and how do we make sure that community voice um, is included in part of that decision making. Uh, Rihanna, do you wish to address that? Yeah, I would be happy to. Thank you um, for the question. Um, so, I guess let me just speak to the most recent process that we went through um, because these were the most significant changes in the district in over a decade. Um, over the previous 10 years, I mean, we, you know, we did have some boundary changes. We had some consolidations of schools, um, but not on the scale of what um, was enacted in, in November. So community engagement, first of all, in regard to closing schools, um, the community impact is one of the factors that's required by COMAR um, to be considered. Um, and of course, that's part of our, our policy and procedure, um, uh, you know, related to closures. Um, so the most recent process we went to went through uh, lasted three years. Um, we started in August 2021, um, meeting with our the consultants that assisted us with this, um, and that included a technical team, but also um, a community engagement firm, PEA. Um, they're locally based, uh, and they were contracted to help us to make sure we got the word out, that our communication was clear, that we were reaching to diverse groups, underrepresented groups. Um, uh, so we began the community engagement piece in January, 2021, and we conducted five meetings. We did three in English and two in Spanish. Um, and the kind of goal of that was 
just sort of education piece, getting people on board with, you know, we're opening nine new and replacement facilities over the next three years. We have, you know, we need to look at boundaries. Um, what is capacity? What is enrollment? What is our process? Um, and, you know, in terms of evaluating those things. So we really wanted to do that upfront work um, so that people could understand Dan sort of, you know, where we were headed and, and would just have a better idea of the work that we do. Um, so we followed that up. Um, well, first of all, we collected a lot of um, feedback. We had small groups um, that had a facilitator and we were collecting um, information, feedback, concerns from um, participants in those meetings. And then, so that information, the community kind of input initially, and then the analysis of our data resulted in our first draft of um, some scenarios for the district to consider. And that included options for consolidating school, um, select schools. There was three different variations of that. Um, Following that, in November 2021, we did a second round of community engagement. Um, we did five meetings again, three in English, two in Spanish, um, and collected feedback on the scenarios. Um, we also did a survey uh, to, so that parents could tell us what their preferred survey was, why, um, rank, and they were able to rank them. Um, and then um, it also allowed free form comments. They were able to also submit emails that we would respond to if they had specific questions or wanted to question a, a piece of data that was you know, put out there. Um, they were able to interact directly with staff. Um, and then out of the survey and the information that we collected from the community, scenario two emerged as sort of the most um, popular, least unpopular, <laughs> I should say, um, option. And that is the one that we ended up selecting. Um, and then we worked to refine that with our transportation. We ended up dropping some of the changes um, just you know, based on you know the criteria that we that we had, um, and then that ultimately resulted in the proposal that went to the board. So that kind of takes you through the whole process that we went through, and community engagement like really drove every aspect of the work that we did with that with that process um, because we knew it was um, going to result in some pretty significant changes for communities, um, particularly those where there are new facilities, which that's excitement to go to a new facility, um, but it also means having to change boundaries. Um, and and so we, we wanted to, we felt like we kind of got ahead of it and then just kept rolling through the whole process. Um, keeping the, the community engaged. Um, we also have a project website that we updated constantly um, with all the documents, everything we did through the process, um, all the recordings of meetings um, so that folks could go back and, and watch those. And again, they can email our, we have an account um, where parents can email us directly. We'll answer questions, um, look into things um, if, if need be. And so anyways, that's kind of a high level summary. Thank you, appreciate that. Board member Briggs. Thanks so much, Chair Serena Ruiz. Um, so I guess I'll start mine with like really quickly just kind of running down the fact that I talked to a few parents, community members, people who were impacted by the boundary changes. And um, and I, I definitely think that the, the process is incredibly thoughtful um, so far. And it sounds like there's a lot that has gone into it. And so that's definitely appreciated. Some of the gaps that I noticed, and I'll just kind of give an example of a family that wasn't here to share um, today. Um, 
but was that there um, have been families that, you know, they, they, like most most of us, they're working and they've got, you know, other responsibilities and obligations. And so they're not as in tune with what all the all the details of what happens with the Prince George's County School District like we are. Um, and there was a letter that was received in October that said that there was a recommended boundary change, which per our policy, that's how we, you know, issue those um, those letters. Um, and when the final decision was made, um, the family, this family in, in particular received that notice, but still was kind of under the impression that it was a recommendation for some reason, because of that was the original um, language that was used. And then there's like this kind of surprise email in March that's like, hey, by the way, your child is having an open house at this new school that they'll be going to. And so, you know, I think this is just a part of the process that no, no policy is perfect and that there's always going to have to be any, you know, iterative process to kind of make it more refined. Um, so I, I guess some of the questions that I was that I'd like to target to you all is. One, and one, one additional piece that I want to add in there, caveat, is that um, this particular family went to the school and was asking lots of questions. What's happening? You know, when, when's the school boundary change happening? What does this mean for my family? And no one at the school had answers. Again, I don't think this is, you know, it was like malicious or anything. It was just people weren't aware. Um, so my first question is, is there is there a coordinated release when a final recommend when a recommendation is made or when a final recommendation is made is there a coordination with the schools um i can take that one um so what we and i'll speak to the again to the most recent um process i think we learned a lot um with you know doing such a huge um such a huge project um, so we, first of all, we have a, um, advisory committee that was established in our administrative procedure a few years ago, and that has been really helpful. We actually meet monthly, um, since we were kind of meeting like quarterly during the process. And then once things were approved, we've been meeting monthly. Um, and we, that group includes um, school leadership. So area office, area one, area two, area, not area three, because they don't have any changes, um, but area one and area two. Um, so that we can all be on the same page about what's going on. Um, but that's after the fact. So before the fact, before this, um, these changes were put before the board, we en actually engaged principals. Um, oh, in 2021, we engaged principals um, on this process, what was happening, what was rolling out. Um, and, um, you know, sharing out that, that information. And there were some principles that we actually worked with one-on-one -on, -one on their boundaries. You know, they may have had complicated boundaries or they may have had, you know, opinions on things. Um, sorry, do you want to? Yeah, just cause it's like a minute. So I just wanted to get clarity. Once the recommendation was made, was there, was there like a coordinated release or some type of communication with the school leadership and the administrative staff? So it's my understanding that bef right before, so that the, the space between when, I think October 13th, when the board presentation was made, and then when the recommendation went to the board, that there was a meeting with the area offices, with the principals that were impacted, um, and those schools are listed in the PowerPoint um, that um was presented um you know for I guess for the first reader um that's that's yep sorry go ahead okay great so but not with the not with the administrative staff like it was just with the principal but not with any of the additional say. not that I not that I know of okay. um yeah. yeah so I don't I I can't really speak to how that process rolled out um with the communication from the area office like to the principals down to like registrars mm -hmm. um yeah. Okay. And then and this is my last question. So was there any, do you all take into account when you're making the final decision, unique populations of students? For example, you may have a student that's in fifth grade, they're going into sixth grade, and then they'll be transitioning to middle school. So they'll be moving to a new school after that. And then after two years, they're going to a new school. So there's, there could be a lot of displacement for those particular groups of students. Is that factored into the decision? 
Yes. So two things. Number one, the board um, granted a grandfathering provision. So any students that were going into fifth grade or eighth grade could stay. And we did a whole process to collect that information. And that's kind of still ongoing because people may have missed it or something. So we're still monitoring that. Um, and then um, the other thing is we know, like we're always thinking ahead with boundaries because we don't want to ever come back to a community in like three years and say, we have to move you again. Um, so we know the second round of Blueprint is coming and we we already kind of looked, determined like what areas we think would be impacted and specifically did not move any of those students because we knew Blueprint was coming in a few years the second round of Blueprint. Thank you. Chair McKins Murray. Thank you. Uh, my question is around once we've made the decision and parents, some will still be upset and some will still not want to move. How do we communicate to parents when we're beyond the point of changing the decision? How do we do that? Um, that's a great question. <laughs> um, John, uh, he may, he, he's kind of on the ground um, with that. So he may want to jump in after me with, you know, some details. Um, but we've been receiving a lot of that feedback through our school.boundaries account, which that's where we call anyone publicly that has any kind of questions around boundaries can email that account. We get back to them within 24, 48 hours. Um, so, but John's been kind of leading that. I don't know if you want to say something about that, John, in terms of volume or just messaging. No, um, just as you would expect, it's been pretty consistent. I've kind of made that my main uh, purpose over the last, what, six to seven months is to make sure that I'm um, being consistent in clarifying what the options were per the policy. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so exactly. Just um, making sure I'm clear about what the grandfathering clause stated and whether other options that, that individuals may have in terms of um, uh, working also with the student transfers, even though they, they weren't looking at actual uh, boundary transfers, but, you know, there are a lot of mitigating circumstances. So, I think we've done a pretty good job of working with parents to identify their unique situation per the policy and, and trying to get back to them as quickly and as clearly as possible. And oftentimes it usually means working with registrars and administrative staff at individual schools, making sure they also have a clear understanding of the policy and working with them to get the word out. Okay, yeah. okay. but I, I guess my ask is at some point with all decisions, you can't change them. Yes, that's you correct. So, the one, change them. so yes, yeah. So in our student information system, when, when we make the transition, students are identified what their new boundary school is. So as students go to enroll in that school or attend the school the following year, it'll flag if the student is in the wrong school. So it, it goes back to our, an enrollment and registration process. Now parents can appeal. They can look for boundary exceptions. That requires a whole nother process. But again, once the board approves the boundaries of where they are, we set that on a technology side of which those boundaries are then set for our students. And so then even from a technical perspective, a registration perspective, those students have to go where they are unless they go through some type of paper appeals process through our student records office. Okay, I, I appreciate that. And I think that it may be some opportunities for the board to uh, help with that messaging because I've sat through several meetings where parents are complaining about decisions that have already been made. Mm -hmm. and, and from my lens, I don't see an opportunity to change those decisions. So that, that was helpful. Thank you guys, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Board member Boozerstrath. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I um, went through this entire process and participated. I, I think in just about every community meeting in 2021. Um, and the um, you can see in the documentation that um, the, the Zoom participation was very high. We actually sold out one of them. We got over 500. And so the interest was high and 
the ability to see the three scenarios of what could happen to your school was out since January 2021. But because of the um, all the uh, distraction of, of the realities of you know the pandemic and school closures, Dr. Goldson recognized that we had to do the whole process all over again, even though from a board member perspective, I was pretty uh, pleased with the engagement of everyone. And you know, everyone knew, you, you know, came to those and they probably represented just about every school to some extent that that you knew if you were potentially going to be closed since January, 2021 consolidated um, because your low enrollment had been going on for years. And I think one thing that happened in this process is we just allow under-enrolled schools to go on for too long. I'm just going to say it, you know, as someone who represents overcrowded schools and lack of resources, under underutilized schools should probably, you know, be be really looked at and and um, should have moved more quickly because that impacted a lot all at once and everyone was looking for sort of equity and fairness. Who's getting a new school? Who's just being consolidated into another old school? So I think you know we have a chance here to to kind of recognize some of that and there's this real fear in our system and others of of accepting these schools that get down below 50 percent utilization i mean we just have to you know i mean i don't think we're going to have that many when i look at the numbers i still see a few that i'm like are those numbers going up why did that school why is that school still there um so you know and the one thing this was a consensus vote of the board and i'll tell you and i can tell you why we all had pain no district had no pain and so we but you also had to look for as a board member the the good you know so we all these blueprint schools coming online i could say to elementary school families this might feel painful that you know you're leaving this neighborhood school for this one but you will be going to the new hyattsville middle or the new sonia sotomayor middle and adelphi so as a board member, you really have to know, you really had to know all the moving parts. And one thing I did is I of all, I, I sent the data and the everything to specific parent leaders in just about every school where I could identify someone. And it was all it's always easier when there's a PTO, PTA. And I made them analyze it. I said, I need you to have someone analyze this data so you can tell your school community what's to come. And that helped. So then I had that whole population of schools that did it and could communicate. And then I worked with my council member, um, Denny Tavares, to communicate to the schools that didn't have uh, active, that may not have had active PTAs or needed more Span Spanish language, uh, that she could deliver that in Spanish language. So that partnership really helped. So if you're thinking about if you're a board member and this is coming up in the future, um, those are those are some of the tips I would say, but but yeah, I think the information was out there for a really long time. I think it's just hard information to accept, and like it take you know. I'm glad Dr. Gold. It was tough that Dr. Goldson extended the process for a board member because the band. I wanted the band aid ripped off, and we could just start moving forward because this was coming. This was going to happen, but it, it she did that, and you know, I, I guess my question now is. We didn't finish the process. We did not move the bound the the recommendations for high schools. Are we still in this? Are we still doing this process? So I will end there because as a board member, I want to make sure I'm communicating. Like, are we going to move the high school boundaries? Brianna, you want to share the timeline? Yes. Um, so thank you for that, um, board member Boozer Struther, um, and, and thank you for your engagement. I saw you at every single one of those um, engagement meetings. Um, so you were you were right there along with us uh, hours and hours. Um, so in terms of um, timeline. So we did develop um, boundaries for the high school. We know that we have high schools in the north that are in the planning stage and some in the design stage. Um, and so, you know, those are going to be another reality that we we're, we're going to have to face in terms of who's going to go to those new facilities. 
Um, we also have Crossland High School in the South, which um, there's a desire to um, create a CTE hub there, which there, there already is, but just have that be a just a purely CTE program. So we have some things that are coming down the pike where the new superintendent is definitely going to have to um, make some decisions on how to lay that out. Um, and the other thing that I mentioned previously is the second round of blueprint, which doesn't include any high schools, but um, there's definitely going to be a, have to be a process to figure out who's going to go to those schools because they are going to be larger um, than what's what's there now. So that's what we're looking at in the kind of midterm. So I, I think what I'm hearing you say is that due to the superintendent transition, this sort of this next phase isn't just we're, there's a pause. There's a pause in this next phase just isn't what, you know, when we passed this, Dr. Goldson said, this will happen in a year. And what you're saying is that year is delayed. Am I, am I hearing that correctly? Because of some changes in superintendent, the new uh, tranche of blueprint schools has been determined. Like we know what year the new Northern high school is now going to be completed, things like that. So I don't know if there will be a delay or if things will be like some things will be stacked up in a certain way. I'm not sure with our um, procedure. It really starts with that advisory committee, um, which we give them the data, the info, all of the background information, and then they um create a recommendation to the superintendent and then the superintendent to the board. And so mm -hmm. superintendent is ultimately the decider on, you know, what would be presented to, to the board. Yeah. So I guess the short answer is we're continuing with that process. Uh, so there's, there's no pause, but the beginning part is what happens in the background before it becomes public and goes to the superintendent and comes, you know, and you start all your committee work. So that work is actually continuing. Uh, we'll be engaging in that work this upcoming year. Okay. That. Thank you. Board member Briggs for a second round. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks again for just sharing all of the, the details. I didn't have a chance to um, ask every question, but I wanted to clarify because I um, heard you, um, someone shared that um, there, the, the appeals process does exist. So is that for individual families or is that for, is that like a, a group that has to come together and appeal the decision that the board makes? Because we're the ones who make the final decision um, that goes out to the families. Yeah, so uh, the appeals process is in existence regardless of any type of redistricting that occurs. So what I'm talking about is an individual by individual student uh, that goes through a boundary exception process uh, through the student transfer records office. And so that's where you start getting at this point. There really is no appeals by a neighborhood due to, I don't believe my neighborhood should go to this school compared to this school due to redistricting. That process is, is done. So now within our student information system, all the addresses are set. So if there is a family that wishes for whatever reason to uh, request a boundary exception to go from this school to this school, they would have to go through that process. I see. And how is that communicated with families? Uh, so if they go out to our Pupil Accounting website, they can see that as an option uh, or student records and transfers office. You can see that as an option there. If they would approach their school, if they contacted their school or question uh, where there is that they need to attend the following year, they would be directed to that process. You're muted, sir. Thanks. Hit the button and it didn't unmute. Um, I, I saw the letter that went out to families in October. And I think at the at the bottom, it kind of said like there's the town hall process that's going to happen where communities can come and they can, you know, give their input uh, about the final decision that the, then the board will vote on and the um the superintendent will well, the CEO will pass along. So with this appeals thing is there like an additional piece in that letter that goes for the final determination that says like hey here's how you can appeal this decision if you have issues or is that like they have to figure it out 
So I guess I'm reverting back to the earlier question of what happens after that's been finalized and the board approves and we get to that that later piece because the question was what happens then? I, I believe uh, Chair Meekins Murky, maybe you asked the question. Okay, that's where I was reflecting on. So once everything is solidified and done, the parent would then have to go through that secondary process. Uh, so what you're talking about now is as you go through this process, as we get to this closure of of getting through the board approval and and when you get to that point of making that decision, is there an appeals process itself for relocating neighborhoods and so on? That is, there's not, I don't Rihanna, you can speak to this. There really isn't a solidified appeals process for that. It's more soliding the feedback from the community and trying to work that into the proposals, which would then go before the board, right, for your adoption of what that final proposal is. Does that help clarify? Yeah, and I just I want to add one thing to that, especially with this big process, is that we have students going out of schools and coming in at the same time. And so if, you know, we got a lot of people that wanted to appeal, you could have a situation where you don't have enough room because you have too many people that want to stay, but these new students are, are coming in. And so making sure everything stacks out, that's that's part of what drives us in terms of like exceptions like I'd love to be able to grandfather everybody um I, I'm sure everyone would but because of that in and out and the numbers lining up that's it get, becomes a challenge and the last also, thing I'll say because my time is up oh. I have to say it's also one of the things I deal with on a regular basis working with administrative staff as to if there is in fact an option or what that is and who with the uh, individual talk to to hear. Yeah, and I was going to say, you know, like this process is that the policy is up and we can kind of make some additional pieces to tweak it and make it stronger. And, you know, for those gaps that might exist, I think they can just kind of offer that wraparound support. And, um, you know, I, I wonder if even to your point, um, Mrs. McCarter, you know, around who who qualifies for an appeal like is it setting determinations around you know not just anyone can say that they don't want to send their kid there but there has to be reasons that we can identify or the new superintendent can identify through regulation around that so um i appreciate you sharing all those things thank you <laughs> board member bruce strether for second round no no okay <laughs> any more questions comments colleagues Okay, taking into consideration the discussion we had, um, I believe this policy should come back as discussion, Ms. Welsh. Um, or would, or colleagues, do you want to take action? Uh, may I ask a question, please? Yes, go ahead. Um, so, remember Briggs did provide some recommendations and changes to the policy and um, to, the, to the revised policy that we have right now. And one was that in looking at all the considerations that the, um, the advisory committee actually does review and consider before they even come up with a recommendation, he recommended that maybe there should be something, uh, uh, another item that says unique pop student populations that make uh, that would be significantly impacted by these changes. Um, so I didn't know that if the committee was interested in incorporating that. I'm thinking of uh, possibly um, special education classrooms that might be situated in one building and the movement of that, how that impact might be. I don't know. I'm, that's just something off the top of my head in reference to his suggestion. And then I think, I think, and I don't, at, at, based on everything that Rihanna just shared with us, I feel like there, the, all the steps were quite you know, they were advertised, they were told, um, parents knew, but um, board member Briggs did suggest possibly under standards E, instead of using the language adequate notice, that we might um, provide some other kind of language. Now it says adequate notice must be provided to the parent guardians of students in attendance at all schools that are being considered for closure by the board. In addition to utilizing the PGSBS website, written notification shall be advertised in at least two newspapers having general circulation in the geographic attendance area for the school or schools proposed to be closed and the school or schools to which students will be relocated. 
So my question would be, um, and then it also says all the, uh, at all informational means the superintendent shall provide information requested by the board, including but not limited to it, enrollment projections, demographics, and facilities utilization and utilization data. So my question to the committee is, do you want to add any other language to either one of these uh, um, items, E, um, e or F? Um, I don't know. I'm so I'm just I'm throwing it out now that you also have all the information from um, our the uh, people who deal with boundary changes all the time. All right. Thank you. I will recognize board member Booster Strother first. All right. Thank you so much. I'm going to respond to where you noted. Um, can you say the first recommendation again about unique co community or? Um, Unique student populations that may be significantly impacted by these changes. Yeah, so I'd like to speak to that because I I um, did submit a memo to Dr. Goldson where where I definitely um, made that case. Um, we had one situation in a different a scenario. We was not impacted by the final scenario two. Um, so I was making a case on scenarios one, two, and three, knowing only one of these scenarios would come to be and it was scenario two which took away some of, like which then eliminated some of the things in my memo but one was like I said I engaged the parent PTAs of all the schools near each other and we saw that one school if we moved this one particular neighborhood from the one school to the other school the receiving school would just become even more high concentration of poverty blueprint community school and the other school would lose a neighborhood that actually is keeping it on the edge of receiving those services at about a 70% population rate for Blueprint and Title I. And so to me, that falls under that scenario that we that if that had happened, we would have a school principal who now has even more need and students to serve and another school where a large percentage just lost the extra support that they need. And so to, to me, they're, they're, I made that, I certainly made that case. I made that case around a neighborhood that always kind of gets overlooked because it's on the railroad tracks. And we always are like, oh, we don't, they can't walk. We have to put them in a bus. So they're gonna have to go here, even though their neighborhood school is right there, but it's not safe to walk. And we are gonna make that accommodation so I made some of those cases. So I agree. I, you know, I didn't get everything I noted in the memo um, on behalf of my constituents, but you know, District Three also has you know a lot of new buildings, and like you know, we looked at the positive where we could find it in those cases for those students. So, um, but I, I I would support having the opportunity to have those conversations. Okay. Thank you. Chair McIntyre. Thank you. I, I can appreciate both uh, suggestions that um, Mr. Briggs made, especially the one about adequate notice, because that term is ambiguous. I mean, adequate means different things to different people. So to define that could be good. So I support both of those changes. Um, so I guess I would support this document coming back for uh, more discussions. Okay. Yeah, I, I uh, also echo that call. I think uh, we should bring this back for further discussion and, and hopefully also maybe um, have uh, some public input into this too in our next uh, policy and governance committee meeting just to hear uh, from the public. Uh, but I think board member uh, Briggs has made some um, really keen observations and I'd like to see if we can consider those um, at our next meeting. Thank you. All right, Ms. Welsh, if you can bring this policy back for the next meeting uh, with the recommendations that have been suggested. Okay, I will put in some um, some uh, recommended language and then we can come back and discuss it. Thank you. All righty. Moving on, the next policy for discussion um, is policy 6139. Test security and data reporting. Ms. Welsh. 
Okay. Um, so the um, with that policy. Okay. And uh, oh, good, Cindy. Um, basically, um, the policy itself had a lot of language that was already. Uh, um, well, first of all, let me just say this policy is driven by Comar. Um, it, it lays out very specifically in our regulation, state regulations, specifically what we need to do when it comes to set, test security, as well as uh, what needs to be reported to MSD, to parents, that type of thing. So the policy itself, the way it is, it's been sort of reorganized a little bit and um, definitely put into our format. Um, but it really is almost step by step what is required by the state regulations uh, in terms of test security and um, and the uh, reporting. So what I can do is just uh, take you through it real quickly, and then we can talk more specifically any discussion, whatever, um, and you know go further further. So first of all, there is the policy statement, and it, basically it just say, says that the board does recognize. Um, that these state assessments, as well as our locally mandated assessments, are an important part of the educational process, and that the board uh, recognizes the importance in administering these assessments with fidelity, and that the res results, along with other data sources, are accurate measures of students uh, and schools' performance in accomplishing learning uh, outcomes, as well as youth provides the data that can be used for the improvement in classroom instruction and curricular programs. So the purpose is to, of the policy is to establish a fair and consistent guidelines to ensure that test administration of state mandate assessment and any other external assessment are secure, valid, and reliable, and to promote the highest standard of testing integrity and ethics by educators and students. Um, and then the other piece is to ensure that the standardization, fairness, and equity in testing and accurate reporting of the test data um, in Prince George's County Public Schools are followed um, uh, as outlined in the Code of Maryland Regulations. So those are the two purposes. So then there is a definition of a local uh, accountability coordinator, which is the person who is the liaison between the Maryland State Department of Education and Prince George's County Public Schools for state and um, locally mandated testing. And then I did, there's two definitions. One have to do with locally mandated assessments. The other one has to do with state mandated assessments. So as far as the standards, and this is where um, this comes directly from the regulations, it says that, um, and we do have a, a, a department that um, of testing uh, that actually does, is very involved and oversees the entire assessment process. Um, so it says the superintendent of testing department and a local accountability coordinator to implement the Comar test administration reporting requirements. And these requirements consist of uh, for of and that the I will say point out that the administrative procedure that will go with this policy will be in great detail because there are a lot of specifics in terms of the whole testing process and the security of the testing. So there's it talks about the procedures in terms of ensuring the security of the test materials. And then it talks about the fact that the uh, this the department and the local accountability coordinator will develop and implement annual training protocols for all staff participating in the administration of the assessments. Um, and then there will be uh, random monitoring during testing administration to ensure that everyone is following all the rules that they're supposed to follow. Um, it also will prohibit existence of any kind of electronic devices, including personal devices. Um, unless it might be used possibly for an accommodation for a student or something, but in general was not allowed within the in the test in the rooms where the testing's going on. That that the that office as well as the local accountability office will investigate all reported allegations of uh, testing improprieties, um, and then also implement a testing administration record retention procedure. Um, which all testing uh, information is retained for up to six years after the date of test administration, and then implement that the, um, uh, data reporting procedures. Um, and what the Comar states is that, first of all, there has to be accurate and timely collection and storage and retrieval of data. Uh, that's required by State Board of Education. And then reporting of assessment results to parents and guardians of students within 30 days of receipt by Prince George's County Public Schools, but no later than the 15th of September for spring assessments results. And then the process for delivering of assessments results to the parents and guardians. 
And then the last thing would be training on the um, appropriate um, reporting procedures. So the other pieces that are, I, I did add into it is that um, um, that all staff that are that are handling any new test um, material materials um, involving in testing directly or indirectly do, are required to sign off um, on a certification of training form to show that they have been trained in everything, and this is done annually, as well as um, they. Um, the board and Prince George's County Public School cannot take any kind of personal action against as a retaliation against an employee who would report information that they saw another employ, um, employee uh, involved in some type of test security violation. And that so that's that's basically um, our the um, whole idea of not retaliating and the whistleblower protection. And then the last thing is the board and PGPS um, may, though, take personal action against an employee if uh, after investigation it's in concluded that the employee was involved in reporting in the reported test security violation. And then basically it just uh, directs the superintendent to develop an administrative procedure to implement this uh, policy. We currently do have an administrative procedure, but it would need to be updated. Any Ready. questions? Thank you, Ms. Welsh. Colleagues, floor is open for discussion. Questions or comments? Are there any? Um, seeing none, that means Miss Welsh did her job. Okay, board member breaks. No, Miss Welsh did a great job. So it's not anything I just wanted to clarify. So for the one provision that says, um, the electronic devices. I can't remember which one it was oh, for four. Uh -huh. um, only thing I had a just it says all electronic devices. And I know you said accommodations and that's like, you know, for different disabilities or things like that. But I just wanted to make sure that that took into account health reasons too. I'm not sure that if that could, would. It could absolutely. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Perfect. Perfect. All righty. Any other comments, colleagues? If not, Ms. Welsh. I believe we could bring this item back for action. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Strader, for joining us tonight. Feel free to stay for the rest if you'd like, but now you probably want to go home. <laughs> so thank you for joining us. All right. Thank you all for your time. Have a good night. Thank, thank you. you. All righty, moving along, colleagues. The last policy board discussion is policy 9360, meetings of the board. Mrs. Welsh. So this, this is a policy that um, we have discussed many times. And I think back on January 17th, that was the last time we discussed it. And um, and it was recommended that we um, uh, hold off and not do anything with it until we got through the legislative session. And actually it's very wise that we waited because there was one piece that we had where it, in within the policy, it said that the, the chair and co-chair would be, uh, the board would vote on the chair and the co-chair of the board every year annually. But then we had a law that was passed last year that said it would be every two years. So then we switched it over to every two years. And then um, the, now with uh, 437-1079, it has now been switched back to one year. So I did, so we had the last time we looked at this, we had, it was biannual and I just switched it to annual to reflect the change in the law. And then the other change that um, was in this policy that you guys, that you all had requested had to do with the idea of um, notice um, when we move from a uh, in-person meeting to a virtual meeting. And I think, I, I'm not sure now, uh, um, Cindy, we'll just have to go through it because I'm not sure it should be. Um, I have page seven, but I'm not 100% certain that's what you're going to see up when you scroll down. Yep, there it is. Perfect. Um, so I the request was to put in language that said um, that there would be an exception to a one week notice requirement would be in cases of an emergency such as public health or inclement weather in which then 48 hours may be required. Um, and then I did include that down in the bottom too, uh, where it says uh, majority board members must notify the chair in writing of the change to a virtual meeting at least one week prior or in cases of public health emergency and inclement weather at least 48 hours um, 
to the, I, I can't see the little piece that's uh, to the board meeting. So, um, so those, were, I think those were the very last changes that were uh, requested. We, uh, I know there was a conversation and my notes reflect and Dennis hop in there, if I'm incorrect about this, where it talks about the number of board members that make up a quorum for voting. And we had decided to keep it the way it was at this point, uh, the language. And, and if we had to, then we'd make changes. We would um, change it if the, um, once we got to that point, I mean, that's, uh, so I think if I'm incorrect, please let me know. Um, but I think that that is it. We've made, we, you know, we have gone through and made um, a lot of, you know, a lot of changes as we worked through the process since the very beginning. Robin, I think you're hundred percent correct. Those were the last few changes. My only concern is that I believe there may be one or two new board members since we had this policy. Um, I just want to make, oh, sure you're right. make sure they've had an opportunity to review it. Um, if they need more time, they can let us know and we can bring it back for discussion. But if they've had ample opportunity or don't have questions, I'm okay with it moving forward. Um, I will say, just for the new board members, I will say that uh, one of the things we were attempting to do was to really, um, from a um, compliance perspective, try to make sure we were really clear in terms of what's happening, depending on the nature of the board meeting, what's happening in different sections, like in the consent agenda, um, the whole idea of, of for when you go into closed sessions, what what can be discussed? We incorporated all those things that can be discussed when you're in closed session. Um, conversation about the special meetings, and I think also um, that we incorporated language that talked about that it would be that if the item, I think actually board member Business Brother, you brought this up, was that if an item comes up. Uh, what you didn't want to see was that you're sitting in a board meeting and all once this item comes up and you are the, all once called upon to make a decision and that you wanted clarification. And we did put that language in under special meetings that the board may be called by the chair. Um, and that uh, if the meeting is for discussion, the topic of discussion must be cited. If the meeting is to propose an action, the proposed action must be cited. Um, so, and that no uh, a business shall be transacted as semi except for which the meeting is called. So that it was very clear for board members that you you don't come into a board meeting thinking, well, we're just gonna have a conversation and then you all once you're being asked to vote on it and you, you really feel like you haven't had enough time to really consider it because it, it just was just like that. So I think um, I'm just looking at, um, um, and then there's like limits on like the agenda preparation. We also made some changes in there and clarified um, like when they when it needs to be in, uh, provided and also how many items a board uh, member can um, request um, as a discussion item. Um, I'm thinking that's, and I do, I agree. There's so many pieces to it that you might want to just uh, have the time to re look at it before we finalize it. Um, I think that's basically it though. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Welsh. Colleagues, floor is open for discussion. Start with board member Booster Strether. Well, thank you. Um, I wanted to raise if this is a good time to uh, address the issue of the board prayer. I think, you know, we've learned through um, NSBA and other um, other op opportunities that, you know, we, uh, I'm not saying to remove the prayer, but I'm saying that we have a single prayer and that I believe like what we see in our municipal uh, meetings now that there's now um, an invitation to to pray um, in a moment of, of silence instead of a, uh, what used to be like say in my town of Brentwood was the Lord's Prayer. Um, we might I, I think we we should question if we're in compliance with this and um, I know uh, board member fields, I think you had shared some information about that that you had heard at NSBA if you wanted to reflect on on the on that as well yeah yes and um uh, at a minimum a preamble before we have the board prayer because um 
the manner in which we do it now, it almost seems compulsory. And I think we have to give um, the public the opportunity to participate if they so choose. Um, and so that would be my concern um, as we move forward, um, as well as sort of the diversity, the global nature of the prayer to make sure that we're being very inclusive if we are going to have prayer before a meeting. Thank, thank you for adding uh, your you know perspective. And, and so I, get, I think it's something that we do need to discuss if we're going to modify how we do the prayer um, part of the agenda would be a good time for us to make a decision about that since I see that it is called out in this document. And that, that concludes my comment. Thank you, Board, board Member Bruce Strelley. Go to Board Member Briggs. Thanks so much, Chair um, Sermon Ruiz. I just want to say that to the question that Mr. Whitley asked, um, I feel good about the um, the policy. I read through it, so I'm good. But I actually do agree with the, the, um, the last piece around just being inclusive in the prayer. So I would actually say that I think that is something that we should update. Um, but beyond that, I, I, I'm in agreement with it. Vice Chair Pills, I think he went on to you. OK, I'm sorry. I didn't hear. Thank oh. you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, too. Uh, uh, have had the opportunity to review uh, the policy, um, and I think it's really well uh, drafted. Um, what I would suggest, though, is that the policy itself is almost a primer uh, to really understand board meetings. And I don't know how often the public really reads our policies. And I think this might be a good opportunity to translate this into lay plain layman's language as a primer for the public because there are a number of definitions in a policy that I think are important for the public to understand. Um, and I would expand that also to include legislative terms, because I think we often take it for granted that a public might understand what an agenda is. Um, you know, when you look at the, the definition, a closed session. So I think this is great, but I hope that we could somehow create a document that might be a little more user-friendly um, for the public as sort of a civic education piece on this is how your board conducts its business. Uh, but the policy itself, I think it's very well done. Thank you, Vice Chair Fields. So colleagues, any other questions or comments? Oh, Board Chair McIntyre. Yeah, I don't have a comment. I like the policy and I can tell a lot of work went into uh, putting this policy uh, together. I agree with uh, Vice Chair Fields. Maybe we should put it in our um, handbook or something or Mr. Fields, were you thinking about a standalone something? What were you thinking? I was thinking about a standalone uh, sort of um, document that, that could be easily accessible for the public. Um, okay, so that something that could be a hot, a hot link on our website that they could just click on? Absolutely. Okay, thanks. Thank you. All righty. Based off of this. Our yes, up. Hand up. Sapora. <laughs> Board member Sapora has her hand up. Oh, hi. Board member Dr. Miller. Sorry for not recognizing you earlier. Oh, no, no worries. I know I'm not the part of the committee, but I actually really liked um, board member uh, Field's suggestion about uh, layman's terms. And not to belabor that we don't understand it, but I think that uh, there should be some, uh, I know that not everybody comes to this committee, but we should reiterate to our colleagues to take a look at it and be familiar with um, this policy and the changes that have been made um, and recommended. Um, because I know we're going to take action of it, on it, but I, I really uh, would like us to intentionally ask our colleagues to have an understanding of the document so that we're consistent, consistent in how we conduct business. 
Okay. Thank you. Um, so, Chair Averell Saron, um, in response to um, Dr. Miller's ask, if we get this document approved, this policy approved with the next two meetings, no, does it have to go for public comment first? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So, yes, it would. I was well. We could give the rough draft to the to the uh, board members at the retreat. Is what I was thinking. So, that's a thought. Thank you. Thank you. So, colleagues, are we comfortable with taking action? I see your hand, board member Pusistra. Um, uh, action. I mean, are we going to make some minor adjustments based on the conversation, or are you saying to move this as is? Ms. Bush, if you can make some, some proposed changes, and then we'll bring it back, um, because is the retreat before our next meeting? Let me double check. Or Cindy, if you know, can you let me know? <laughs> no. No, it's not. It's first. Okay. Yeah, next meeting. Oh, you mean the, the policy committee meeting? Yes. Yeah, the board meeting. I'm sorry. The policy the committee is on the 13th. So it will be before the board retreat. Okay. So, Ms. Walsh, if you could bring, prepare a new rough draft. And do you want me to bring it back to action? Because I'm just thinking um, that Dr. Dr. Golson then would have the opportunity to review it and approve it before she leaves versus if we if we right. just bring it back for discussion it will then kick over to august and and I, i'm only thinking just the fact that she has a lot of experience this would probably make sense to her and she certainly will be able to identify anything that might be possible issue i don't know okay. right. and, and mr chair if the only issue is uh, the a silent uh, moment of prayer or a silent prayer as opposed to a a, a, a rope prayer um, I think that that could be fleshed out later on. Uh, that's the only issue that I heard from the board. If there are other issues that uh, Ms. Welsh would be changing, I don't know if there are. Yeah, I'll, okay. I'll, just, I'll just jump back in. I was going to make a, another point and then and kind of responded to the question you had put out, um, is that we, we've added a pretty consistent agenda item of the uh, board member's opportunity to do um, the shout outs and the um, unsung partner. I know that there might be an umbrella term that we would choose for that, but the listing of what is on an agenda doesn't in include that. And we've been pretty consistent for, I mean, I, I think about a year that we've had that, that opportunity. So I don't, we may need to insert that agenda item here on page three of 16. And I can do that. And I don't know that it needs to be so defined as the terms we use, unsung partner and shout outs. I think it needs to have more of an umbrella term of board member recognition or community something. recognition. Yeah, community recognition, some something that doesn't confine it to the model that we use today. Uh, th th that was my final point, thanks. Okay. Thank you. So, Ms. Welsh, if you can make the following recommendations and bring it back with an updated version for action. Okay. 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 I will do that. Thank you. All righty, colleagues, moving along. We have three policies for reviewer action. First one is policy 3506, public charter schools. So colleagues may have a motion to forward the revised policy to the full board with a recommendation to seek public comment. So move. Second. Okay, it's been properly moved in second. Ms. Welsh, would, like, would you like to give an overview? Yes. So, um, the, so I just, I, after all our conversations and everything that we've had with uh, both the public charter school office uh, employees with us, as well as with the feedback we have received from board, uh, from uh, community members and from public charter school people, um, 
we the I have not made any changes to the policy only because the the big issue that happened previously that we had a conversation about had to do with the idea that the that the the um, public charter school office was um, had this prospectus step that that when they would when a person who wanted to do a public charter school they would have to send in a letter of intent and complete this prospectus step. And if the prospectus step did not meet a certain criteria, that the criteria that was um, that had been established, then it would not. Um, they it, they would be told that they did not meet it, and they would have to resubmit, redo it, and it would not be looked at for this upcoming year. They could not submit an application. And basically, between myself, Dennis, the Office of General Counsel, we also consulted with other another school system um, to that. Um, um, has lots of public uh, public charter schools and has gone through the appeal process with the state. It was pretty pretty uh, unanimous. Everyone felt strongly that if there was ever an appeal, that it, at the state board would definitely rule against us because we did not actually do this application. Uh, decision it was for numerous reasons. One was it never really made it to the board to even to look at to make a decision because ultimately they're supposed to be that is based the, the superintendent provides a recommendation based on the evaluation of the application and then and it can be either to accept the application or deny it and then the board has the opportunity to review it and look at all the results of the evaluation and everything and the recommendation and they make the final determination of whether or not they're going to accept or deny the application and so with the prospectus step in place, it never gave the board that opportunity. So that was not in compliance with the law. And then the second piece is if someone wanted to, to uh, appeal that to the state board, the state, uh, there's a very high probability that that would not be something we could win because it because the law is very clear that there is this application process and it's 120 days once you receive the application. There's nothing about any other steps in the process. It's just merely the application. So um, we we did meet, and I also spoke with with um, Dr. Golson as well as the public charter school, and it was agreed that the prospectus step would be removed, completely removed, and they would not be including that in anything. That they certainly the the um, anyone that wants to do a public charter school can send in their letter of intent. As soon as they receive that, then the public charter school will, charter office will send to that person um, an application for them to complete with directions and everything. And then they, they go through the whole application process. So based on that, there was no reason to make a change to this policy, to the new policy that we just did. And this policy, if you recall from when I shared with you before, is almost again, step by step, what is required by law. Uh, because there is a uh, one of the statutes actually says what you must include in your policy for the um, for um, public charter schools. So um, I basically, it just goes over the Board of Ed's authority and then uh, the, it talks about public charter school funding, student enrollment, school facilities, the reporting, audit reporting requirements, the evaluation of the public charter school, and the revocation of the public charter school. It lays out all those pieces. Um, and then um, it talks also a little bit about the audits, the financial programmatic compliance audits of public charter schools, all the reporting requirements. Um, it's it's like pretty like straight lined with the law. So that's basically what I'm bringing back to you. Thank you, Ms. Welsh. Ms. Boozer-Struther, see your hand. Uh, yeah, I just uh, wanna say, I think the concerns have been addressed and and I think this is ready for public comment. And I, I anticipate we're gonna have some comments on this. Thank you, Chair Mickens Murray. Thank you. I see here that we still have a total of 120 days from receipt of the application, correct? That is correct. So when does it come to the board? Because the board, I don't see here where it says when the administration must give it to the board. Because if you don't have that, you must establish these board meetings where you got to get it on the agenda. I, that is not, I, I, uh, that, that's there's, 100, not... there's a 120 day timeline. So mm -hmm. there's no, the state doesn't tell the administration they have to get it to the board within 90 days. The board just has to make a decision within 120 days. If you want to do an AP, maybe 
where you say how much time the board must have to review it, that's more of an AP issue. Or, or a board, um, poli um, I know a board policy, but in our handbook. My concern is that, and, and I know that I'm not thinking gamesmanship, but I know that if the administration did not like a, um, an application that came in, and then you give it to the board and we only have maybe a month uh, to look at it, that could be a problem. So that is my concern. Is the board having enough time uh, to review it, to get it on the agenda? And you know, we have to do first read a second reader, all of that. So the so the first reader gives you the opportunity to um, it puts out notice to everyone that you're considering uh, the, the you know the application, and then um, the second reader this is where you actually vote. So there is, a, I mean, you're really talking almost they almost have to cut off a month out of the. 120 days just for it to, to get to the board because of the yeah but my point here is that it doesn't say that here that's all it just says that the ceo gives it to the uh, board but it doesn't say it doesn't have a timeline and that's my concern is that it doesn't have a timeline for the administrator to get it, the administration uh, to get it to the uh, board for consideration well, and generally we put stuff like that. I would agree with Dennis. We do generally put that kind of information into the administrative procedure because it's it's directing staff that they must have that to complete it by such and such so that the board then has a certain amount of time to be able to review it and um, evaluate it. Okay, so who determines that when you put it in an AP? Is it we tell you today or the administration tells us? I'm just asking. We have the opportunity for the board to tell the administration what they would like, um, since we get we're basically getting the first bite at the apple. But I would think that it would be more co cooperative. Um, so I, again, um, if the board wants to take a position and say you want it at least thirty days before the one hundred and twenty days is up, uh, you can do that. But I would say that you should probably talk to the um, charter school office and get some input from them letting them know that, hey, we need as much time as possible to review it. What's the least amount of time that you can actually do a full and, and, and good review and get it to us so that we can do our job as well? I mean, we have some other board members on this call and some of you have had more experience that, with this than I have. But I know this year the, the concern was, first, we never got the application, so now we're gonna get the application. So when I read this, I just don't see when we will get it. But if you don't think that that will be a problem, um, I can go with what the majority believes. And, and I don't have an issue saying to the saying to the um, people that do the, I mean, ultimately I'm the final reviewer of the administrative procedures. So I don't have an issue ensuring that there's a timeline involved that uh, that incorporates so that the so that both parties really have enough time because the evaluation process itself is really extensive, but I absolutely understand that's a tremendous amount of information that's then being presented to board members to really to, to review thoughtfully and take time to look at before they make a decision. Um, if you had your druthers, like I would be interested in knowing what you think would be the maximum amount of time you, you think would be ideal, and then certainly share that with the with the charter school office to see what their thinking is and see if we can't come to something that sort of meets everyone's needs. Yeah, well, I'm just thinking you must put it up for first, you must put it up for public comment. First reader, then public comment. Well, public comment first, first reader, second reader. As long as you can incorporate that into some days to allow the board ample opportunity, I'm good. Do, do the, does a decision like this that require public comment? Wouldn't it just go I don't to the know. Reader? Does it? I don't think so. Okay, if it doesn't require public comment, then the month would may suffice. Just depends on what's going on in the state of Maryland. And the only other thing, only other comment I'd make is just. Uh, board people be prepared because if we get three or four or five at one time in one year, that's going to be a long night for the board. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. And maybe, maybe um, 
I'm just thinking maybe one thing is to make sure you have notification that an application has come in so that you're aware of it right from the beginning that there has been receipt of it and they're in the evaluation that process. That could help. Thank you. And again, that should probably go on the AP. Yeah. Uh-huh. Thank you, Vice Chair Fields. Uh, thank you. Um, and those latter points are my concern in terms of quality control. Uh, because we're, once we remove the prospectus step from this procedure, the prospectus allowed the administration to offer some recommendations if they saw areas of improvement before the application process. So now we're just going to get the application. And so I think we do need some administrative procedure that provides us with sufficient time because Mr. Whitley is exactly right. If we get multiple applications we're in for a very long process. So I think there should be sort of an alert once we get an application, the clock should start. We should have a defined period for the administration to review and afford the application to the board so that we'll have sufficient time to consider and make any recommendations on an application because some applications might be approved, some might be an outright re rejection, but some we may say, hey, if you do A, B, C, and D, uh, but we have this 120, I'm assuming the 120 day window suffices for everything that, yes. that, we can, that we can't come back and say after 120 days, fix your application. So we have to get it all in and at 120 days. So the board will need sufficient time to review if we would if we want to make any recommendations or go back to the applicant so the applicant can make those adjustments. Uh, I'll, I'd have to do some research, but I believe the applicant might be able to waive the 120 days if uh, if you said to the applicant, hey, we um, we like your application, but A, B, and C need to be done. Um, I think the applicant might be willing to waive the 120 days if they thought they had the opportunity to get their application approved. But I'd have to do some research on that just to make sure. But I do Thank know you. though that the, the state of Maryland does absolutely expect that when we go through this evaluation process, it's not like we just get the application, evaluate, and then you get this final thing. They're supposed to be constantly giving feedback to the charter school as they go through the evaluation process and then say to them, you need to change this or you need to change that. So if in fact, let's say that we didn't do that and then they come back, the charter school decides to appeal, the one thing the state board's gonna look at is, did the school system actually provide enough uh, feedback to the charter school so that they knew what, what kinds of things they might need to change and stuff? So, and that whole process is supposed to be going on the entire time before it finally gets to the final application, like the end of it that moves on to, to the board. I'm just going to come up. Go ahead, okay. Borman Briggs. Um, for the sake of time, we're, we're cutting it close. So um, I just wanted to say I heard two issues um, and just wanted to mention maybe some possible remedies to those issues. So the one thing is like, I actually fully agree with um, Chair McKenzie Murray around just protections in the actual policy. And I feel like it'd be nice if we just had something in there that says that the board and the administration will negotiate or you know identify a timeline that is feasible for both so like there's just in that policy that we have to work together to come up with the timeline right so that's embedded in there that's a part of the process and then as far as the administrative procedure i'm pro flexibility i feel like we also should be very um uh um aware of the fact that there to, to mr willie's point there are going to be times where we'll have a, you know a large group of charters and then maybe we'll have other times where we don't and so i think we should we should we should urge the um the incoming administration and their team to be flexible in their language and that's possibly something we could bring up as for a board vote um where we actually like kind of annually identify a timeline that works um and just have some language in the, the ap but in this policy we make it that it needs to be a negotiation between the board and the administration Thank you, board member, Dr. Miller. Hi, thank you. I know uh, board member Booza Strother hand is up and she's on the committee, so I didn't want to take away from her time. 
Do you want me to wait till after her? Oh, thank you, Dr. Miller. I I'll, I appreciate that. I'll I'll jump in. Um, they uh, I I did want to note that you know when these new applications come, they do come with recommendation to adopt the charter school or to not. You know, so administration does do the due diligence and does have a an opinion. And since I've been on the board. Um, they actually, administration has brought forward a, a does not uh, recommend um, and as well as the one, there's one that was recommended that is now operating. So I did, I just wanted to make that point that we, you know, it's not up to us. You know, we, we do get, you know, the feedback from the staff and, and frankly, the documents really do show it. You know, I, I you could, you'll be, we'll be able to see the difference of those who are ready and those who aren't. Thank you. Thank you. All righty, back to you, Dr. Miller. Thank you. Um, two things. One, I just, I want to say this. I know that um, I'm hearing that they're getting, because the prospectus part um, was an additional step. I, I want to just speak to that because it does take away what uh, board member Fields mentioned in terms of quality control. And that was, in from my perspective, a step that our uh, school, the school administration took as above and beyond what other school districts do. I'm wondering whether that should be still in there as an option. They don't have to do it. Because if you are turning in a prospectus and you have the vantage point of understanding some of the areas you need to look at, you still can fill out an application, but at least you have some insight of what things you should consider when you're filling out the application. And they did it and it was above and beyond. Not making it, keeping it the same way, because I understand what you mean in terms of, we, if we went before the state board, we may lose. But what, I, what I, I, I want to just add is that they were going above and beyond by doing that work um, and uh, front loading that work that schools, who wanted to establish charter schools had some insight of what are some of the areas that they were strong in, what are some areas that they need to um, really shape up. And I think that, you know, if that's something they want to continue, I think we should be open to that and only say that it, it's, it's an option, you don't have to do it. And whether or not you get the, the pros and the cons, you can still fill out an application. So they'll still have the opportunity to fill out an application. So that was the first part. The second part I was gonna talk about was timing. I want us to be very cognizant not to be so rigid in our policy that we don't, that we uh, shoot ourselves in the foot in terms of 30 days, 20 days. I like the wording in terms of collaborating with the administration. Um, I know as a uh, board, um, we have the ability to call a special meeting if needed. So if this is something that we needed to call a special meeting for because we have so many, it could be something that we could uh, put forward. So I, I don't want us to be so rigid that we say it has to fall on this time. So those are just comments that I wanted to share. Um, Dr. Miller, um, when uh, Robin and I met with the um, public charter school department, it was kind of my impression from speaking with them that they wanted all or nothing. If the prospectus was not a part of the 120 days, I got the impression and, and jumping if you got a different impression, Robin, that they, they wanted you know the prospectus to be uh, separate and apart from the 120 days. But if they only have 120 days, they don't have the manpower to do prospectus for uh, potential applicants and still process actual applications in the 120 days. At some point, if they get more employees, that may be something we can bring back. But uh, the impression they left me with is they just don't have the manpower to do both. And Dennis, that's correct. They uh, Because the evaluation process is so extensive and it re actually requires lots of people beyond their office who are also doing many other jobs. So they really don't want to cut that time short. Uh, it's the same concern almost that, uh, 
uh, board member uh, Megan's Murray sharing is that do we do they have adequate time to do a thorough evaluation then of the uh, of the application if there were a prospectus so they're they're thinking no because I actually I did actually say to them maybe you would like to make it like an optional thing that could be that might work and that was like no that will not work we won't have enough time and, and Robin you you'll follow up with me and Dr. Miller on the outstanding issue once you hear back from Dr. Golson. Oh, so the yes, the it has they the applicate they have um, been notified. The school okay. has. Did you hear that, Doctor? And they they got an application and they are um, yeah um, working on it. So, All right, and just uh, and Doctor Miller brought up an issue. Is there a way to? Uh, I guess we'll make the whole board aware of when applications are applied for. Because um, Doctor Miller just had a concern about an application in her district that she wasn't aware of. So, if there's something we can do with reference to communication with the individual board members as well as the entire board on applications. That's something that might, you know, you might want to consider for the AP. Okay. Thank you. Board member Booster Uh the well, I I was gonna make a point following Dr. Miller, but um hearing what uh, Ms. Welsh covered about the division, um, I absolutely I was gonna say I totally agree with Dr. Miller that that step was actually in some ways a courtesy to the board because I, was so, I think some of us were pretty vocal a couple of years ago when one an application came to us and it was just so obviously the the, the organization does just not have the capacity to, to do this. I mean, the application showed it, but it felt like, I think some of us on the board felt like there needed to be some, I think I heard the term quality control around uh, how far these get before they get on a board agenda. And I, I do think, you know, the diligence around that did, did come from, you know, the, the board at the time. So I did, I did just want to make that point, but I agree with what, what Ms. Welsh is saying about the one or one or the other. I, I fully get that point. So thank you for that. Thank you. And I'll have Dr. Miller close our discussion. Sorry, I just want to clear up, uh, Mr. Whitley. Um, I think I wanted to clear up it, the notification that I was talking about was about the situ uh, the this actual situation. It had nothing to do, and that's something that we can sort out internally. It's not something I need to, that needs to go on the AP. It's something that we need to sort out on the board side. So um, we we can talk about that later. That uh, that didn't have to do with administration. Thank you. Alrighty, colleagues, are we pushing this policy forward for action or any objection to um, moving the policy for action? Seeing none, Ms. Welsh, if you'll bring it back for action at the next meeting. Okay. Oh, well, actually, never mind. What, what am I doing? We, we are actually... There was a motion. Oh, we on are the acting. Court. Yeah, we are <laughs> acting on it. <laughs> so um, it, there was a motion. There was a second. All righty. Are there any objections to forwarding the policy for public comment? Question. Hearing none. Question. Are we yes. including Briggs' suggestion? Are we, are we going to send it forward, allowing... Um, uh, Ms. Welsh to make that uh, addition or not? Are there any objections to adding this to the policy? To adding Board Member Briggs's recommendation? Can you just restate it, please? Thanks. Yes, please. Mr. Briggs or Ms. Welsh, oh, if you have. Yeah, yeah. No, the only, uh, I was just saying in the, in the policy that there would be some language saying that the board and the administration staff shall work together to, you know, identify time, a timeline that works for when the application would get to the board for, um, for voting. In legal language, that makes sense. Colleagues, any objections to this language? Seeing none, Ms. Welsh, please add this to the policy and hearing no prior objection. Well, are there any objections to forwarding the revised policy to the board for public comment. Hearing none, motion passes. Policy will be pushed for public comment. 
Next policy is policy 5110.3, transfer of students. Um, is there a motion to forward the policy with the recommendation to seek public comment to the full board? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been properly moved and second. Ms. Welsh, a brief overview. So the um, the policy, uh, the voluntary uh, transfer request for students uh, policy, it was basically revised to include the circumstances in which a student may attend a school other than the identified residential boundary attendance school. Um, and then it um, provides the fact that in addition to these 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 uh, circumstances that, that allow you to have a transfer, that the other issue has to do with is the school on the a list of available schools, and that's determined by whether or not it uh, um, is over and above the state rated capacity. And then on top of that, if it isn't, and it's now on the list, the other issue is the class size of the particular grade, the class sizes of the particular grade that a student would like to be transfer into. And if those class sizes are too high, then of course the student would not be able to transfer. Um, and then it does provide some language related to with a transfer is going to be um, uh, rescinded. And it also talks about the time periods for parents to request transfers and the communication of the transfer request time periods so that parents know that um, when it is when they can request uh, transfers. And again, I do want to point out from the information that I did receive previously that even if a student, if a parent misses the um, First go round, they do accept the transfer request in the summertime for the second go round for transfer requests. And then finally, the policy does uh, talk about the fact it will not discriminate uh, in this process. This determination of whether you can transfer or not is not will not be based. Uh, no one will be uh, discriminating against based on um, all of the different protected classes. Um, and you did ask a couple other questions that I did get information about. Uh, one had to do with um, uh, you had, um, when the terms of the transfers, so I think it was up uh, for member fields, you asked the question, was there a hierarchy related to the reasons that um, uh, parents want um, transfers? And is this really a function of climate in the school? So, um, the, um, I'm going to read to you the list of how it was, what it was set up before, because that it was the highest number of reasons. First one had to do with safety. So that was the first one that 90%, uh, this came through 90% of them, I guess, were related to safety issues. The second one had to do with bullying, harassment, and intimidation. Then um, the next one had to do with foster care foster care, which is really, you know, I mean, if a parent, if a, if the um, if DSS uh, actually places a student in a school district, you know, where then we, the school system doesn't have a say in the matter, basically the student does get the right to go to the school. Then there, the next one was a special ed administrative transfers. Um, and generally they were often requested by the special ed central office uh, administrators. The next one was employee-based. Um, then um, and the next one was discipline, um, fresh starts. So like be asking to be transferred um, to get a fresh start so that you're not continually getting in trouble in that particular school. Then the next one actually had to do a strange a change of residence during the school year. The medical so, and not wanting to move. So can you stay and finish out the year? The next one is medical or psychological reasons. Um, and of course, that is actually then reviewed by our office, the, the our psychological services or office of school health, which will review those requests. And then uh, rarely, but they occasionally get a uh, uh, complaint if the reason they want to be transferred is because of gang related activities, but that's rare. And rarely do they get a request because the sibling is in a, um, is a, ESOL stu a student receiving ESOL services and they want to go to the same school as the where the sibling is. So those are the two least amount of reasons why. And then they asked the question, what the next question was, how many complaints do you receive from parents who did not receive a transfer for their schools? I think board member Mickens Murray asked that question. And they said uh, for, uh, 40 or less during the open window, um, uh, 
uh, basically related to either the school or the grade level was unavailable, and then 10 or less if the window is closed. So I guess that's what they received during that time period. And then the other uh, question that was asked was, are transfers allowed on the online academy uh, or are there special requirements that need to be met in order to attend the online academy? And so actually the online academy is not considered a school, it's considered a program. And so there's a whole separate admissions process into the program. So that is not even considered in the transfer process because it is one of our special type of programs we have. So all I think right. that, that was all the questions that were asked last time. Thank you, Ms. Welsh. Colleagues, any objections to forwarding the revised policy to the full board for public comment? Okay, hearing none, motion passes and the policy will be forwarded to the full board for public comment. Last policy for action is policy 5114.1, students existing before attainment of, students exiting before attainment of diploma or certificate. Ms. So colleagues, is there a motion to forward to the full board a recommendation to seek public comment for this policy? So moved. Second. It's been properly moved in second, Ms. Welsh. So, so this policy, uh, just a quick review of it, is basically um, uh, the, um, the it's the idea that if a student expresses an interest, to, they're gonna they're going to um, uh, quit, they're gonna drop out, and they're not gonna finish up so that they can graduate. Then it's based on Comar, and it basically says that. We as a school system, the school needs to, first of all, try to find this out and then provide the student with tiered interventions and support to address the student's individual needs. They're also supposed to work with the student, encourage the student to, to continue, remain enrolled in the school or participate in some other alternative program. And then they are also required to uh, uh, conduct an exit interview, an educational exit interview with the student um, and their parents, if possible. Um, for uh, to find out specifically what are the reasons why the student wants to drop out and also to make sure that the parents and guardians are informed because these students are over the age of 18, they're 18 or older, that they are the parents are informed that this is what the student intends to do is to drop out. So that's that is basically the whole, the whole policy in a nutshell. Thank you, Ms. Welsh. Colleagues, any objections to forwarding the policy to the full board? Hearing none, motion passes, and the policy shall be forwarded to the full board for public comment. Dr. Miller, I see your hand. I am so sorry. Um, I was trying to raise my hand. This is just a comment, and I'm wondering, um, Ms. Welch, does it include for students, and, and this is my thinking behind it, We, as um, a school system, we want to do everything we can to ensure that the student finishes, and we know sometimes they say, you know what, I'm 18, I'm still in the uh, 10th grade, I haven't done well, I, you know, I, I just want to do something else. But does it include provisions for counseling them so that if, if, this is, if this is their will, that we're not losing them, but we're giving them additional resources that they can seek out, be it job or be it, you know, attaining their GED, be it, you know, so it may be that they just feel that the school setting is not for them. Um, does, does it allow for that? That um... so, so I agree that when the section where it says, and this is again right from the state regulations, where it says to provide the student with tiered interventions and supports to address the student's individual needs. So in that realm of what could be an intervention or support to the student could absolutely be the counseling. In fact, I would suspect that that's probably the more frequent thing that is provided to students than, than when anything when you think of interventions like educational or instructional interventions. I'm certain that's probably not it as much as it might be the counseling and the, that kind of support that the student might need. And we can we can specify that in the administrative procedure too, just to make sure they're, that they're clear about the um, the interventions. Okay, yeah, because I know I don't want the policy to be against so rigid that if a student just says, this is not the setting, I, I do want to start my career, how can I finish, and we give them an opportunity to finish and still get their GED or high school diploma um, in, in a setting that, that uh, works for them. Right. 
I think that's the whole goal of this is to be able to try to find some other some way so that they can make it through and end up with their diploma. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Thank you, Ms. Welsh. Alrighty, having heard no objections, motion passes and the policy is forwarded for public comment. Next up, we have um, so a policy that received public comment. So policy 5168 um, was voted by the full board to seek public comment and we received four public comments. Um, so Ms. Welsh, if you do a overview of the four comments, so basically, um, the all four comments were very. They were um, people want to make sure there are AEDs in the schools and that people are trained to use the AEDs and that they're available to anyone that might need them. Um, they um, so they were very positive. They did one comment does talk about the fact that they, uh, so if you recall, the high schools have the most AEDs, then the middle schools, and then the elementary schools. And part of that's also driven by the law that talks about athletics and what's required when you have athletics going on in the school. And this one comment, um, and it's a parent who has uh, shared this information, is thinking that it doesn't mat really matter whether it, what grade level it is, that we should have the same number of AEDs in elementary schools as that we would have uh, in middle and high schools. Basically, all grade levels would have the same number of AEDs as a high school has. Um, and so that was that comment. And then um, and then it, the, another comment says that they think that it's really important that um, employees also are, are trained in um, AED, uh, utilizing AEDs. And I will share with you, um, to be able to train and get everyone certified, all our employees, I, that, I don't see that as an actual possibility just because of, first of all, the many, many, many competing professional development requirements that employees have, in, especially our school-based staff, they have lots of re requirements. However, what we, uh, there is a, um, a, um, module in safe schools that actually talks about AEDs. And so we had decided that for this upcoming year, we are going to put it in under, along with our mandatory, we have a list of what's optional that we think, and we, we write a little note that we think this is, even though this isn't mandatory, it's very important. And we're going to put it out there because I would suspect, like I watched it, I wasn't required to watch it, but I watched it just because I thought it would be helpful to have the information. You never know when you might have to use an AED. And that doesn't certify me as an AED user, but AEDs actually are pretty easy to follow. Many of them have the directions right on them. But just having that knowledge is just helpful. So we are going to incorporate that into the uh, optional section for the training for this upcoming year. Okay, thank you, Ms. Welsh. So I'm gonna do a motion, then we'll go into discussion. Um, so colleagues may have a motion to forward to the full board, policy 5168, automated external defibrillators with the recommendation to advance consideration as first reader at the June 8th Board of Education meeting. So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been properly moved in second. Now I'll turn to Ms. Boozer's brother. Yeah, I'd like to address the comment about elementary school, which I, um, um, yeah, I realize now, you know, that doesn't make sense that they're not in elementary schools. I mean, we now have schools being built for 800 students. That's a lot of adults in the building every day. Um, and of course, uh, adult guests who, um, uh, not to say that no young student could ever uh, be in a situation and need one, but so can we explore that a little more around the elementary um, schools and having these? We could talk a little more, Ms. Wells, if you could talk a little more about that. But, so I, if I recall, and I'm just trying to look back in my emails from what I had received from um, from Safety and Security Services, who is actually responsible for AEDs. If I recall, the elementary schools only have one AED. And I think the high schools have at least three AEDs. Um, so it is definitely a reduced number of AEDs in the elementary schools. Um, thank you for that. I guess what I'm trying to understand is 
you know, we get pretty specific in these middle and high schools. So if there's one in an elementary and now we're building schools that were built for, you know, four or 500 students. Now we have these 800, you know, these massive 800 um, seat schools. That's a big, there's now, I mean, should it be more about um, adequate to serve the population of the school? I mean, is that, should that be more clear or is that, or will administrative procedure address what I'm bringing up? Like that there needs to be, that one, one of these in a, a big school is not gonna, could, could end up being too far away. If it's a, a K through eight academy, would that not fall under a middle school or would we address that in the AP? Because uh, uh, as we move toward academies, as opposed to pure elementary schools, would that not rectify that situation? Well, we have elementary schools with 800 seats now, and we have more on the way that are just K to five. Okay. Cherokee Lane being the, the newest, you know, and I think about how large, how long it would take to transverse, you know, that school in an emergency. So that's, um, that's, you know, what I'm thinking about now. And Mary Harris, Mother Jones actually is already that big too. Um, there may be more that I'm forgetting. I, I, in answer to your question, though, I think if that is that's really um, um, so we, that's an item that is a money <laughs> item because it costs money to uh, incorporate more AEDs into the buildings. I'm not sure how much they cost, but I'm just saying that. And certainly, um, it's probably I'm thinking. Um, a, a, an administrative procedure wouldn't necessarily dictate that as much as probably maybe policy would dictate that. Sort of like when we think about like the sustainability policy, if you recall, and we had a lot of conversation about that and some of the some of the things that were in that and how that would impact budget. I'm thinking that, that might be might be a, to go in that route. Excuse me, Chair. I need to go to another meeting. I'm sorry. I, I just have a hard stop. Okay, so you still have enough people to vote. So I need to go. Bye, go. Bye guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. I appreciate you coming. Alrighty, so I'll turn to Vice Chair Fields, then Board Member Briggs. Yeah, I, I think the problem here is that so much of this in the, at the high school level is tied to athletics. Um, and I remember this when my, my daughter was an athlete in terms of the requirement on a high school location. Uh, the other issue, I think, is just a cost issue uh, in terms of if we expanded it, expanded the number um, to elementary schools. Um, and the other comment that I do remember hearing, and I had raised this concern, also was just the notification issue when there was an incident in the building, um, how quickly uh, the individuals who are trained to use this would be notified. And I think someone mentioned trying to use technology to do this because most of the times if you're using one of these devices, it is a matter of uh, minutes or seconds to get mm -hmm. to someone who is um, in, a, in a condition that requires it and that time matters. Um, so in a large building, uh, making sure that you could get to uh, the victim in time so that the device would be helpful before any other uh, medical attention could be given, I think is important. So I think if we do make the decision about elementary schools, we just we just need to accept the fact that some things cost. Um, it, it's sort of like I, I make the same issue with security in our buildings, right? We had a discussion about security and about the different approaches to security at the high school, middle school, and elementary school level. This is sort of similar, and I think the board, we just have to decide um, if it's a priority that we provide these uh, in a way that we, we are sure that even at the elementary school level, there's enough coverage, then I think we just have to take that responsibility and do it. Thank you, board member Briggs. Thank you, and apologies for, I think you might have heard me eating earlier. Um, so I um, just want to echo that I think it's really important that we do, um, for, for safety reasons, we do have adequate 
kind of included in there because I think that um, I just think about you know having been a former teacher and being in the, in, in the school and like how how really significant that is to see for the stress that it puts on I think educators to like know that there's a possibility that you know if you have 800 kids in the school and you have two of those um, that's a challenge. The other thing I'm going to say is I also agree with the idea that um, as I was looking through the policy that the note around where it's placed in the building. Um, I think it's really important too. you know, it should be somewhere in the building that is easily accessible. And I don't see that as I was quickly looking through the policy again, I didn't see that in there. Um, Ms. Welsh and was thinking that we should probably have that in there in, in, in the uh, in the policy somewhere. Ms. Welsh, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, um, and we can... Um... I'm, I'm actually um, right, wanting to write a note and I dropped my pen. So I was looking for my pen. Um, no, uh, we could um, make sure that there is language that says that, uh, about the accessibility of the AED, if I recall correctly, and um, that the, uh, well, actually, um, for the, I thought, and I can double check on this, uh, that in the elementary schools, they are supposed to be well, she, actually, the safety officer sent me an email that says the first unit is always mounted in the wall cabinet near the gym, and the others are strategically deployed around the building to give maximum coverage. Um, so I'm guessing probably they put it in the gym also for, they pro probably have it mounted by the gym in the elementary schools too, because if anything were to happen, like when they're doing PE that uh, for a student or something, they would have that available. Um, but of course, I would say that working in many elementary schools in my lifetime, I would, that would probably be the last place I would think that the AED would be because I would think it should be up by the office or something. That's where I would be looking for it. Uh, but I can double check on that and, and um, you know, we can have further conversation, as, but I would have to get more specific information for you. I mean, you could incorporate language that says this, the AED um, is placed in a place that is highly accessible or something like that of course some of our buildings um and i know you've all been in them numerous times so depending on how they are built that just because you say maybe they're going to be near the office or they're going to be here that might not necessarily make them highly accessible just because of how the buildings are are structured um i mean i guess it would be better to just say highly accessible um something like that Yes, okay. if that was the question, yeah, I agree. Oh, sorry. No worries. Thank you guys for bringing this up. Therefore, um, I'm not sure who had made the motion, but whoever made the motion, I ask that you rescind the motion. And I will follow this. There's another hand. Or member Booz's brother. Yeah, I, I was just trying to dig a little deeper to see if my concern could already be covered by these emergency you know, plan action plans that could raise for an individual elementary school the the that they would need more than one. And I did note that the um, term freely accessible during all school functions is under um, um, B three um, D, which covers, I guess, what Ms. Welsh, what you were saying that during you know how we close buildings off during athletic event events that one always has to be available. So I see that uh, listed there. But I, my concern is still more about between this policy and procedure, could an elementary school request more than one? If they if the emergency plan revealed that would be the best um, course of action. You're talking about their school safety, their, their big emergency plan for their school. Is that what you're referencing? I'm I'm referring to the how the policy is written the venue specific emergency action plans you know I'm oh that's the one for the you know, athletics the yeah schools okay. have a, someone who's writing the action plan is outlined here the AED coordinator I'm just trying to determine if 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 it doesn't prevent an elementary school from saying for say Cherokee Lane saying you know when we were in the old building anyone could get to the AED in X amount of time, but now in this new building, we're realizing they can't. So I just wanted to make, I was just looking to see if there's something making sure that wasn't prevented. 
so that that piece that has to do with the emergency action plans that that is specific to our athletics i think and so that actually really elementary schools aren't even involved so there's nothing there to actually help with it but i'm just wondering if we had a little bit um stronger language that talked about uh, I know we have freely accessible, but uh, something I don't know that might be a little bit more clarifying because I'm just thinking purpose of policy is to say what you want to see, and then the system has to determine how they want to go about that, uh, but without direction from the Board of Education in terms of um, more more um, ADs, like say in the elementary schools, if that, if that what you're thinking, um, because of all the other competing interests you know, when you think about the budget, that doesn't necessarily mean that would would show up unless the board actually specifies that. I believe it's been the uh, it's the pleasure of the these members of this board that uh, we explore how we can have more uh, devices in, in elementary school. So maybe Robin, we can go back and discuss it and see if we can come up with some language. Um, addressing that. And I think I'm hearing that you want the same number of devices in elementary schools as are in the high schools, or what do you give us a little more guidance, or are we looking at the okay. number of students? Size of building, transverse, okay. tra time to transverse in the building, you know, and this could mean old buildings that have had lots of extensions added onto them, and it could mean the brand new buildings that are just much larger. So getting back to uh, adequacy of of access to the device. Is that and information? Physical that means. Is that information it's that you can get from? Access, yeah, during the school day or during uh, evening events, you know. But you know, but those are usually, I think, they're usually placed closer to the common areas, the gymnasium, cafe, cafeterias, and those that are combined. And Robin, is that information that you can get from the administration with reference to the, the size of building, the size of elementary schools with reference to the number of devices? I can, I mean, I can certainly try. I will see what I can find. The other thing I will also find for you is the cost of the AEDs, because that's that is an important factor too. I mean, and I, I'm not even gonna make a statement in terms of what it might be because I have no clue. So I will I can get that for you too. All right. I think the chair had asked that the motion be withdrawn so that we can put it back out for discussion. Yes, I see your hand, so I'll close discussion with board member Briggs. Sorry, and I'm gonna keep it very quick. I was just gonna say, I wanted to echo that I think we need to just either keep the language very, I'm sorry, <laughs> very general um, with adequate or, um, because uh, my concern is like if we kind of go based on numbers or other things without talking to the administration, I just I would prefer that we I would feel more comfortable if you brought someone who actually is in the buildings every day and knows and has a um, deeper insight there. And the other thing I was going to say was um, um, I'm just curious as well to the money piece. You know, at the bottom there are references. I'm not sure if I'm just just curious if we adopt a policy here and we make a change and that policy shift implies that we need additional funding for something that's covered under a different policy. Um, do we do we note that here? Do we bring that policy back up for discussion? I was just curious if there's any um, process around, like if we're asking for more money and this is tied to another policy, um, is, that, is that a part of this um, process? And hopefully that question is clear. And if not, I can try to clarify a bit more. Um, as far as the actual money piece, I'm not really very clear about how that would all work. But I will tell you this, that we are, in fact, I have already been working on putting together um, the list of policies to start working on for next year. And clearly, if there was a policy this year that impacted a policy next year, like, for example, I can tell you the one that has to do with a that the recommendation to rescind the recruitment policy, but it, first we need to update and um, expand the uh, discrimination policy. So it's sort of like, so that's on the already on the list for next year. So it's like, yes, if a policy, we're working on impacts of another policy, then absolutely we'd want to put it on the list so that we could make changes to it. Thanks. Thank you. And so 
Um, so, Miss Adlian, I, I'm not sure who made the motion. Sorry, it was well, Mr. Fields. Mr. Fields, so if you would so graciously rescind your motion. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I rescind the motion. Thank you. Um, hearing the this discussion today, uh, we will hold this item um, to allow the time for Ms. Welsh and Mr. Whitley um, to take a further look into this policy and bring back something um, more so and more bring back information driven behind what was discussed today, specifically with elementary schools and, um, you know, just the access that there is within schools. Um, if that's okay with everyone, we will move along. All righty. Thank you, everyone. All righty. Next on the agenda, follow-ups from previous meetings. All of us will be posted on board docs upon receipt. The next policy governance committee meeting is June 13th, 2023 at 5 p.m. And lastly, thank you everyone for a great meeting. Thank you everyone for joining us, anyone who watched. Um, and, you know, I'll just keep it brief. So colleagues, are there any additional comments from anyone before I request to adjourn? Mr. Chair, is this your last meeting with us? I, no, I will be, I'll be here at the next one. I'll be here at the next one. <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to make sure. Got one more, I think. <laughs> Thank you, though. All righty. So, okay. with that, may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved. It's, it's been properly moved in second to adjourn the May 16, 2023 board meeting. Any objections? Hearing none, I adjourn this meeting at 7 12 p.m. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.